Rebuilding Rutgers from the Ashes is produced by NJ Advanced Media. Subscribe and listen to the show at nj.com slash podcast. Join the conversation on Twitter by using hashtag Rebuilding Rutgers. As an old joke goes, Rutgers beat Princeton in the first ever college football game and then went on a 146-year losing streak. But over the last few years, the issues around the Rutgers football program have been nothing to laugh about. Before he was fired, Kyle Flood was plagued by off-field incidents that included the arrests of a dozen players and an academic scandal surrounding another one. As the, the figurehead father of the program, it just rips your part inside. It's unacceptable what those players did. Former athletic director Julie Herman, fired along with Flood, arrived cloaked in scandal in 2013 and alienated alumni and donors while enduring a strained relationship with the media. There's a video. I'm sorry, did you say there's a video? They referred to a video, a wedding video, in which you uh, may have said that. (laughs) There's no video, trust me. Now that they're gone, how can Rutgers change this culture? How can the Scarlet Knights go from average to good and eventually great? New head coach Chris Ash started by cleaning house from top to bottom and installing a new attitude, a new coaching staff, and a new recruiting philosophy. New everything, even uniforms. All supported by a new athletic director, Patrick Hobbs. There is excitement and anticipation surrounding the embattled program now, and this podcast, produced by NJ Advanced Media, will take you inside the new Rutgers football regime. Welcome to Rebuilding Rutgers from the Ashes. I'm your host, Joe Giglio. In Episode 1, Steve Politti goes deep with new athletic director Patrick Hobbs and first-time head coach Chris Ash, an unlikely duo with a singular focus, to win. 2016 marks a new era in Rutgers football. Please welcome from Rutgers University, the new athletic director, Pat Hobbs, and the new head football coach, Chris Ash. The moment was surreal to both men. It was May 24th, 2016, a perfect spring day at Yankee Stadium, and Patrick Hobbs and Chris Ash were each about to throw out a ceremonial first pitch representing Rutgers. Six months ago, neither man had heard of the other. Most people around Rutgers probably had never heard of them either. Hobbs was a former law school dean at Seton Hall, considering a new path in life that might have included teaching a college class in tax law. Ash was a defensive coordinator at Mighty Ohio State, buried in his preparations for a game against rival Michigan. New Jersey? Rutgers? Yankee Stadium? But there they were, trying to complete the same task as they had been nearly every day during a transformative six months that preceded the moment. On this day, it was a first pitch. On most days, it was attempting to resurrect the Rutgers football program after an awful 2015 season on and off the field. We'll begin to see the result of their work when the Scarlet Knights take the field under Ash for the first time. And let's face it, no one really knows what will happen in the 2016 season. But we do know this. If Rutgers is going to rise from the rubble of last fall and become a respected football program, it will be these two men who make it happen. Hobbs, the athletic director who built his career in the glad-handing world of fundraising, and Ash, the rookie head coach who is becoming the face of a team for the very first time. Let's go back to November 2015. The writing was on the wall in Piscataway. Football coach Kyle Flood was not going to survive the season. Not after a 4-8 record, not after a half dozen players were arrested, and especially not after an academic scandal put Rutgers back in the national news for all the wrong reasons. Julie Herman, who had a disastrous two-and-a-half-year tenure as athletic director, was not likely to survive either. And it was just about the last thing on Patrick Hobbs' mind at the time. Do you remember where you were the week before you got that phone call? What you were doing? I mean, what exactly was going on? Exactly, which is why all this, you know, uh, people ask me. (laughs) I get asked now sometimes, so, you know, I'm really interested in becoming an AD. How does it happen? I said, serendipity. Um, (laughs) So... Uh, so, you know, I was I had stepped down after 16 years as dean of Seton Hall Law School. Uh, I went to Peru with my girlfriend in the summer. We had a great time and really just intended to spend a year 
uh, relaxing, getting ready to go back in the classroom. I was going to teach tax again. I was actually going to teach a course in sports law, sports and entertainment mm-hmm. law. And um, the Seton Hall basketball team was playing the Charleston Classic down in Charleston, South Carolina. And so we went down uh, and attended the games. And uh, we're playing Daniel Island Golf Course. Uh, and uh, I get a text from John. The text was from John Farmer, the university counsel at Rutgers, and it said three words, can you talk? Hobbs interrupted a round of golf to take the phone call that would change his life. He said, look, uh, and I'm sure you've been following everything that's going on here at Rutgers. I think we're going to make some changes. Uh, Dr. Barchi would like to speak with you. And uh, so I said to him, do you want me on the plane tomorrow? Hobbs was no stranger to Rutgers, or for that matter, to athletics. Yes, he was officially the law dean at Seton Hall, but he also oversaw the athletic department in 2010. He discovered that he loved it, especially interacting with the coaches and athletes. He was interested in the Rutgers AD job when Tim Pernetti was fired in 2013, but ultimately decided against tossing his name in the hat. This time, he wanted it. Badly. With Rutgers, I've always been one of those people, of the many people in the state of New Jersey, that always looks at it and says, why can't they get it together? Why can't they have success at Rutgers? Got a world-class institution, best recruiting grounds in the country. Um, and, and I sort of, yeah, you, you know, or, or anybody who's interested in a leadership position like that would look at Rutgers and say, hey, if I ever had a chance to do that, boy, that would be terrific. Um, and... Um, when the unfortunate things happened with, with Mike Rice and Tim uh, being let go, uh, I actually had a couple of people reach out to me at the time and said, would you be interested? And um, I said, yes, depending. Uh, the depending was on the process. And once I saw the process, um, I, I didn't, it didn't look like a, a process that I wanted to be involved in. And so I really sort of stepped back at that point, never thinking that within a few years the opportunity would come circle around again. He interviewed on a Monday with Barchi, and in stark contrast to the very public and long search process that ended with Herman, Hobbs had an offer on Friday. It was the day after Thanksgiving, and he did not have to think long before accepting. So even before Herman and Flood were fired, Hobbs had secretly begun the process of finding the man who would become his partner in Piscataway. It all started with a Google search. I just got on the internet and started punching in best young coaches, um, you know, hottest coaches in the country, and um, starting to compile a list. And uh, Chris's name was on almost every one of those. Not necessarily in the top 10 or the top 15, but if you looked at sort of like top uh, um, assistant coaches, uh, Chris was out there. And uh, so then um, one of the other benefits, uh, beauties of the internet is um, there are YouTube videos out there on everybody, um, mm-hmm. whether it's a camp, whether it's uh, drills or whatever. So you start to put all those up. Some of them have interviews with the press and uh, others in the media. And um, uh, Chris just um, was an impressive guy. Most Rucker fans have heard a version of what happened next. Hobbs, after all, made it the focus of his comments at Ash's introductory press conference. The new AD was absolutely blown out of the water by an hour-long conversation with Ash, who had interviewed with Syracuse a day earlier. He said he wished he had recorded it to use as a clinic for other job candidates. But it gets even better. The interview that landed Ash a job worth $2 million per year took place by phone. He was in Atlanta on a recruiting trip when he talked to Hobbs, in his rental car, while driving. Through that conversation, he could tell that I was very passionate about uh, what I believed in and, and what I wanted to do, and, and uh, um, I think uh, that's what excited him a lot. It, I, I didn't need a presentation. I'm very confident in uh, uh, the plan that uh, we have here, um, and I don't need notes to talk about it. I've been exposed to a lot of uh, really cool things. I've been uh, around some really good football coaches, and uh, again, I, I feel very confident about our plan and how we're going to do business and the people that I could hire with me. And uh, You know, we just had a conversation. They met face-to-face for the first time at Blue Morel, the restaurant at the Governor Morris Hotel in Morristown, New Jersey. Greg Brown, the powerful chairman of the Rutgers Board of Governors, joined them. It was at this meeting where Ash presented his concerns about the program and where Hobbs did his best to smooth them over. How did he 
you know, smooth over those concerns? What did he say to? Oh, uh, I mean, he with? didn't hide behind anything. I mean, he mm -hmm. told me, uh, you know, uh, uh, some solutions that he had for certain things. Uh, you know, talked to me about some some other things that uh, you know we were going to have to fix, um, and uh, some challenges that we were going to be faced with, and what his plan was. You know, if, if he. Uh, told me that everything was perfect. I would have probably thought uh, he was being uh, dishonest uh, because n there's not a perfect place anywhere. So right. he was open and honest with uh, his assessment of, of things. Um, but the thing that I liked even more, though, is he had a detailed plan with um, trying to how to uh, attack stuff. Hobbs ended the interview by reading off the daunting Rutgers schedule for the 2016 season, game by game, looking for a reaction from the man he was now certain he wanted to hire. And I said, okay, coach, you know, you start out with uh, Washington, come home for Howard, New Mexico, and then it's Iowa, Ohio State, and it's on. And he's like, yep, that's, that's, what it, that's why we do this. Um, and you'll love to hear that answer. Ash was introduced on December 7, 2015. He had barely toured the football headquarters when, with dozens of reporters and the entire athletic department staff, in the room watching, he promised to build a first-class program in New Jersey. It didn't take very long for Ash to find out just how much work that was going to take to accomplish. And so work is what he and Hobbs have done. Just ask them how many days they took off during the first six months on the job. Hobbs came up with a number, 10. Ash won't say if he is over or under that number, but everyone around him agrees, way under. I, I don't know. I'm not counting. It's it's been, uh, you know, football coaching is a grind. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, and I'm not looking for uh, opportunities to take days off. They meet once a week at 7 a.m. each Monday to compare notes. Neither one brings coffee or bagels. Neither one wastes much time with chit chat because they usually work until 10 p.m. on any given night, depending on the week. We're pretty um, to the point, uh, mm -hmm. folks. Uh, we know each other's time is, is valuable, and sort of I don't waste his time, he doesn't waste my time, and we get through. And, um, you know, we haven't had much chance to socialize yet because we're both pretty busy. This is no doubt a symbiotic relationship. Rutgers can only get better if Hobbs raises the money to rebuild most of its aging and inadequate facilities. And Ash needs to produce results on the field in coming seasons to generate excitement. Ash needs Hobbs. Hobbs needs Ash. The opportunity that we have in the Big Ten stage is tremendous. Uh, we have the opportunity uh, to write one of the great stories in college athletics. Ash is brutally honest about everything he believes he needs to build a successful program at Rutgers. From the big ticket items, such as a new weight room, to the smaller details around the team. He says Hobbs has never tried to put him off or change his mind. To make that happen, Hobbs did something that none of his predecessors was willing to do. He launched an ambitious $100 million fundraising campaign. If successful, Rutgers will build a multi-team practice facility. That will completely change how the Scarlet Knights train and help their coaches on the recruiting trail. Ash admits he was somewhat skeptical when he heard the nine-digit number with all those zeros at the end. It, it's really easy to throw out, hey, we're going to go raise $100 million. It's really easy to do that. Uh, a, a lot of people can do that, but it's uh, another thing to actually go do it. Mm -hmm. um, and when Pat threw it out, uh, I thought, eh, that's a little aggressive. Um, but once I, uh, again, had conversation with him about, okay, what, what's the plan to get this done, uh, then I was confident that that, that would happen. If you include a $25 million tax credit from the state of New Jersey, Hobbs surpassed the halfway mark to his $100 million goal in just 15 weeks. Still, it's going to take an incredible amount of work to drive it across the finish line. Ash, meanwhile, was doing everything he can to generate buzz around the program during the offseason. He has recruited at a level that even surprised him, securing commitments from several of the state's top high school prospects. He has also overhauled virtually every facet of the program, from how the players eat and train to where the marching band will sit in the stadium. That's right. Ash has put a stamp on even the smallest details, like what music and videos will be played during timeouts at home games. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we, we want to go win. We're, we're here to, to go win. Uh, but there's, you know, different phases uh, of building the team. The first one is to teach the team how to compete. And um, I want to make sure that our team goes out and competes. And uh, once you go out and you compete 
consistently enough with the right type of people, uh, you learn how to win. And then uh, once you learn how to win, you gotta uh, you gotta learn how to handle winning, you know. And then you learn how to cha- you know, win championships. And you know, right now we're in that learn how to compete phase. And uh, you know that that's got to show up on Saturdays when uh, the fall hits that mm-hmm. we have to have a competitive football team. Remember, Ash is still undefeated as head coach. He knows he is enjoying a honeymoon period, and he also knows how quickly perception can change with a few setbacks on or off the field. Uh, I'm not you know, uh, blind to the fact that, uh, um, you know, there are going to be some speed bumps that are going to happen. Mm-hmm. I, I've told people that a lot. Speed bumps are going to happen. You know, uh, we are going to lose a game at some point. There's, you know, at some point somebody's going to get in trouble, mm-hmm. you know, and it, it's how we respond, how I respond, how the staff responds, how fans respond that will determine how uh, we come out on the other end uh, of the speed bumps that, that we face. And uh, there's going to be highs and there's going to be lows uh, next season. There are for everybody uh, that will determine, you know, can we keep the momentum uh, going in the right direction? You know, if, uh, if my attitude, my approach changes uh, after a speed bump, guess what? We, we might lose momentum. At first glance, Hobbs and Ash are two very different men. But after spending some time with them and hearing them talk, you begin to wonder if, just maybe, they are more alike than first thought. I think we're very alike in being on task. Um, we, uh, we're both very determined people. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I may, um, by, and it's the nature of our skill set, um, have to be out there with our alums more and um, sort of trying to engage people. Uh, but he's doing that as well. So I think we're more alike than, than not alike. <laughs> they are not together a lot on the job. Hobbs works out of the Rutgers Athletic Center, an aging basketball facility where he had to convert a conference room into an office. Ash works out of the Hale Center, the Rutgers football headquarters, where the day's work begins long before the sun rises. But there is one place where they are together. Hobbs has organized a series of cocktail parties for deep-pocketed donors, and it isn't just the athletic director working the room. The football coach is there, too, and while it's a new role for him, Ash and Hobbs work like a team explaining their vision for the program. Ron Garuti, a member of the Rutgers Board of Trustees and a longtime booster, was one of the first to buy in. He donated $1.25 million to refurbish the weight room after Ash and his strength coach, Kenny Parker, thought the existing room was subpar. Garuti sees how Ash and Hobbs complement one another. Whenever there are donor events, uh, they always speak very highly of each other. Now, you know... Look, I, I've spent 30 years in corporate America, and I've I've seen a lot of uh, platitudes and a lot of BS, where people praise you one day, and then the next day they're out to, to uh, fire somebody. Um, I I don't think it's false. I really think it's real. Uh, Chris owes Pat something, right? I mean, he has given him his first head coaching job, and it's at the at a, a Power Five Big Ten uh, school. Uh, yet he knows the challenge that faces him. I don't think Chris is afraid of it. Garuti agrees that the two have brought a new sense of optimism to the program. He thinks the team will be better this season, even if the record doesn't necessarily show that improvement. But the real results here won't be visible in one or two seasons. Hobbs and Ash will be judged by what we see in five years. What will the rebuilt product look like when they're done with the heavy lifting? How will they define success? Hobbs laughed at the question. He is putting together a comprehensive strategic plan to detail exactly what Rutgers hopes to achieve as an athletic department and how it will use its resources to get there. Still, he knows his predecessors weren't given the time to see their best laid plans through. You know, uh, it's very difficult to speculate when six of the last seven ADs were fired. (laughs) So... Uh, I don't know that I want to uh, go out there and, uh, uh, and speculate on that. Um, and it's going to take time. We, you, know, you, you ask for patience, and it's hard to ask people for patience who've been frustrated for a while, right? Because uh, now you're asking for more patience. Um, and, you know, the, the, the number of people that I've encountered who want, and I'm not talking about football or basketball, but want some facility built or some program supported in a way, and I have to say, I've been here six months. <laughs> you have to be a little bit patient. And they say, well, I've been here 40 years. I get it, I get it, but um, give me a little more than six months. Ash offers more specifics. The facilities, they will be revamped within five years. 
The team? It will be one that can compete with anybody and will have the full support of the state's high school coaches. The program? It will make New Jersey proud again. I, I see a, a, hopefully a complete transformation in a lot of things. Uh, the dark cloud that was kind of over the Hale Center uh, will be completely removed. Uh, and it'll be a bright, sunny day that uh, there's always uh, energy, positive energy uh, in this building and in the stadium. And a lot of people want to be a part of it. As for the short term, we don't know what's going to happen when the Scarlet Knights take the field. If you ask fans their expectations for the season, most would probably agree. They're pretty low. However, around New Jersey, there is a sense of optimism about the new leadership. There is a belief that the two men who threw out those ceremonial first pitches at Yankee Stadium are steering this football program toward better days. That night in the Bronx, they actually took a moment to reflect on the strange journey that brought them here and brought them together. But only a moment. You know, uh, it, it's one of those things that, uh, okay, it happened, now what? Okay, you threw out the first pitch at the Yankees game, all these good things are going to are, are starting to happen there's some momentum uh, starting to be built but what do you do with it you know how do you keep it going that's the challenge steve it seems like for the first time in a long time everyone or at least the two most important people like we're talking about here on this episode are on the same page going the same direction in Rutgers. i mean that's the impression i'm getting how about you i mean you've been immersed in this do you feel that yes i mean that's absolutely the case and if you go back to before all they took over i mean i don't think there's any relationship whatsoever between julia herman and kyle flood it was a very strained relationship at best now you have two men in hobbs and ash who are clearly in this together. And both of them have, have said that, you know, Ash said he wasn't going to come unless he was comfortable with the athletic director. And Hobbs said the same thing, that, you know, he, he wanted to find someone that he knew he could work with on a daily basis because that's the importance of, of what they're doing. And it feels like in other schools, other athletic departments around the country, like programs that are really good and really successful, that's what you see. You, know, oh, you see, sure. I mean, the coach usually is the one we see more of because, you know, when they're winning games and all that. But they always... It's a good. It seems like a good relationship in most of these places between the AD and the coach. It has to be a partnership because they work so closely together, and and each one of them is key to the other success. I mean, you're not going to be a good athletic director if you hire a bad football coach. And in the other way, if the athletic director is not doing the things to build the program, to give you the resources to win, most likely you're not going to win. And I think they both know that and recognize that. How about your impressions of each of them individually? Because I, I really think together it seems like a good team. Right. But now each of them, they're their own person. They're probably There's probably going to be at some point where they disagree. But how about each of them? Sure. We'll start with Ash because he's, I think, the one that's becoming the face of this, even though Hobbs is so important. Right. Your impressions of Ash just – him as a, a person and, and as a coach we think he might be. Well, I knew right away with, with Chris that he was going to be a different kind of dude when, when, when I asked for this interview and he said, great, how early can you get there? And I'm thinking, I don't know, 8, 9? No, he wanted me at 6 a.m. Okay, so, yeah, that's I, different. I was there at 6 a.m. to talk to him and it just, I mean, he's ready to go at that time. I mean, he is one of the most serious people I've encountered in this business. I've tried, I've tried in a few interviews to put in a couple one-liners to, to, to loosen them up, but no, he's really all business and I think that's kind of what they need at this point. They need someone who is going to be, you know, completely focused on, on the job itself. And, and that's, I mean, I think he, I, I don't think he's had a day off yet. Yeah, it seems like almost a steely focus. Like, I have a lot of work to do here, and there's just there's no time for me not to do right. it. He lives and breathes the job. I even asked him at one point, all right, so what do you, what do, you do? I mean, what do you do when you're not doing this? And he kind of looked at me like, well, there's not a lot of time when I'm not doing this. I'm spending time with my family. His leisure time reading, he reads books that are, are on motivational stuff, on coaching. On, so even when he's not working, he's doing things to make himself better for the job. It almost reminds me a little bit of NFL coaches. You hear that, like they right. sleep in the office and it's all they do. It's all they think about. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's why he's been so successful and why he's gotten here relatively quickly. Remember, he's only you know, 42 years old. To already have a head coaching job at a Big Ten program is a pretty big step. Now, how about Hobbs, who comes from a different place but clearly has a background in all this? And uh, to me, it seems like he sees big picture, and, and I think Rutgers needs that. Absolutely. And I, almost from the beginning, you know, uh, I've known Pat for a while. He, when he was in charge at Seton Hall, he was really— he had this a bad situation with the basketball coach Bobby Gonzalez there, and he, I think he took this decisive action. He fired Bobby Gonzalez. He hired a new coach, you know, and he really put a stamp on that program. And when he took over here, what struck me right away was just how quickly 
he went about things. I mean, Rutgers has been in the situation for years where they need to really launch a major fundraising job, drive, and, and people have been hesitant to do it so quickly. But he, he really, within weeks, had announced, we're raising $100 million. And I think that opened a lot of people's eyes like, okay, <laughs> this is happening this time. And the fact that he's already halfway there, I think, speaks to uh, his, his success level at, at being a fundraiser. Yeah, it's funny. I feel like Rutgers always, the program, it's always like, soon, one day, right. patience. <laughs> but these two, they don't, I mean, I understand it's not going to happen overnight, but they both seem like, let's do it now. Not, let's do it yesterday, not right. tomorrow. What, what, what Hobbs told me was that he wakes up every day and he says, all right, what, what am I going to do today to make Rutgers better? And that's, he, he told his entire staff that that's what he wants from them, that he wants them to take the same attitude to the point now where he's getting texts from coaches at, at 10 o'clock at night that says Rutgers got better today. You know, the people are kind of focused and driven on that. And I think that, you know, that speaks to the level of urgency. Look, I mean, he, fans have been waiting now for, for 30, 40 years. You know, this is not like these guys are new. They've only been here for, for a few months. But they've got to remember that this fan base has been desperate for, for success for a long time now. Yeah, they have, and that reminds me of the Oregon slogan, what, the win the day? They always want to win today, and then tomorrow will be good, and, and hopefully Rutgers has that. All right, now to me the big question, Steve, is, and this is almost unanswerable, but I'm, I'm sure you have a feeling on it, can they do it? I mean, this is yeah. – everything seems great. They're both energetic. They, they have good backgrounds, but this is not an easy school, not an easy program to put – Right. in a great position. Can they do it? Uh, I will say that if it doesn't happen now, it, 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 it might not happen. And I mean that honestly. These are, these are two uh, very smart, driven people. I mean, the challenge is obvious. They're playing in a division with Ohio State, with Michigan, with Michigan State. All of these programs already have this level of, of commitment. They already have the facilities. They already have the coaches. They already have the fan base. You know, Rutgers is trying to is playing catch up now. Uh, and there's, you know, really, you can't. And this is a, this is a world where Ohio State's just getting more and more and getting better and better. So it's certainly an uphill climb. Can they do it? I think so. You have, to de- you have to depend on what you're defining success as. Are we talking about winning a national championship in three years? No. But are we talking about being a football program that Rutgers can be proud of, that can go to bowl games, that can, that can win consistently? I think it's possible, absolutely. And you know what? That, I think, is probably music to everyone right. who's listening to this podcast years. Next time on Rebuilding Rutgers from the Ashes, Ash and offensive coordinator Drew Merringer introduce the spread, an increasingly popular offense Rutgers is running for the first time. We will not be a finesse offense. We'll be an offense that's driven uh, by uh, a physical offensive line, uh, but we'll have skilled players on the outside that can make plays out in space. We want to equalize the numbers on offense, um, and part of that is using the quarterback as a run threat.